House Lirandar has done some trading with the people of the Saren Islands here. If anyone else has, I don't know about it. People, Rian said. Elves from Arganessen? Or Lazarite colonists? Neither, Jordhan said with a frown. They're human, but they don't look like Lazarites. Well, they act like Lazarites. They're pirates and raiders. Sounds like we should avoid the islands, Gavin said. If it exists in Dungeons & Dragons, it has a place in Aberon. In this library of Korenberg, I'm going to be looking at one of the core races of Aberon and their place in that world. Which races are core? Since 5th edition is current, the ancestries that appear in the 5th edition player's handbook, human, elf, including drow, halfling, dwarf, half-elf, gnome, half-orc, tiefling, and dragonborn. And then there are the ones that appear in Eberron Rising from the Last War. Warforged, Changeling, Shifter, Orc, Goblin, Hobgoblin, Bugbear, and Kalishtar. These have all been consistently the most important playable races in Eberron since its inception, with few exceptions. We're going to be looking at humans, which are basically the center point for most D&D worlds. All of the information provided here is based on canon material, counting Keith Baker's writing from the DM's Guild. If there are any small changes to the official canon, it is done to smooth over edges between materials from different editions and writers. For each of these videos that cover a single race, I will cover their in-world history, cultures and religions, any dragon-marked houses they might have, as well, if they have a homeland nation, I will cover that too, which humans don't really have. Then finally, I will look at which books contain the rules to play that race, including any special rules for how to play dragon-marked characters of that race. Like most peoples in Eberron, the exact origin of the species is shrouded in the mists of history. Eberron doesn't generally have exact creation stories, for the species' actual beginning, unlike Core Worlds of D&D, for I see the story of elves and orcs being created by their central gods, Corlon Laurentian and Groomsh, respectively. It's left open if humans were produced magically by the gods, meddling by powerful beings like dragons or fiends, or if they developed through processes like natural selection. What we do know, humans emerged as a power on their native continent of Sarlona. Sarlona is a fairly harsh and varied environment, ranging from arid deserts to tundra regions, and has strong and wild manifest zones tied to the plains, which makes things even more unpredictable. Despite this, or possibly because of this, humans adapted to all of the environments. Humans mastered basic metalworking, shipbuilding, and many more technologies. However, the magic that they did learn at that time was different than the magic used most often today. Fundamental understandings of arcane workings were different. Most spellcasters followed paths that required an external source of magic, like the Manifest Zone or a pact with a powerful being. So human wizards would need to relearn when they moved to regions with lower frequency of the Manifest Zones and other wild magics that you find in Sarlona. Having mastered a continent, humans of Sarlona inevitably came into conflict. The largest of these turmoils was a 500-year tumult called the Sundering, which was encouraged and shaped by extraplanar forces. But it resulted in waves of refugees spreading out from the Virgin core, and humans migrated into sparsely populated parts of the continent and also went abroad on ships. The first wave of these went east, and resulted in the human populations in Western Corvair, specifically in the Shadow Marches and the Demon Wastes especially. Other waves were led by explorers and pirates, like Lazar. She and her lieutenants, like Malian the Reaver, went from Western Sarlona into Eastern Corvair, bringing settlers, criminals, and raiders over. 
More ships followed, and these people displaced the remnants of the Goblin Empire of Dakan, and soon their own petty city-states and kingdoms were formed. Those original leaders do still echo through the ages in some place names to this day. Lazar has the whole Eastern Principalities named after her, and the city of Sharn was founded by Malian the Reaver on some goblin ruins, and to this day a district is known as Malian's Gate. From the beginning, Corvaran kingdoms encountered and incorporated peoples of other races, elves, dwarves, halflings, goblins, and more through conquest and trade. So while the kingdoms were human-dominated, other races were always part of them, and the races were at least partially integrated. The city-states and small kingdoms consolidated power over centuries. The most powerful of these more or less lined up with the modern five kingdoms, centered on the cities of Theliost, Roat, Metrol, Carlactin, and Descara. Out of Carlactin, Karn the Conqueror emerged, conquering the whole region near that city and creating the nation state of Karnath, named after himself. A descendant of his, Galifar Irwirnin, went on to conquer the other four regions, and named his new empire after himself, like his ancestor had, and the four new provinces after his five children, Syri, Bray, Ondair, Karn, and Thrain. Those children would take on governorship of the provinces named after them. The kingdom Galifar and its five nation provinces officially lasted for 996 years upon its official breakup in the Treaty of Thronehold and the end of the Last War, though it was de facto ended 102 years earlier upon the start of that war. The Sundering led to the fall of the human kingdoms of Sarlona. The inspired and their chosen were the saviors. They ended the wars and strife and created a new kingdom guided by the spirits of light called Il Altas. The many nations and cultures of Sarlona were largely subsumed over the course of centuries as the inspired sought to unite all of Rirdra in one culture under the path of inspiration. Human culture in Eberron is extremely diverse, possibly more diverse than humans in our own real world. Human cultures vary greatly, continent to continent, nation to nation, then even within, class structure, wealth, occupation, education, and more all directly affect the cultures that humans participate in. Since the emergence of the Inspired, the eight provinces of Rirdra have homogenized. Though, there is still a little leftover character, so a Pyrene tends to be a little more devout, an Orcolunian slightly more rebellious, and the Riavarites more daring but diplomatic. The regions not under the control of the Inspired in Sarlona still have their unique cultures, though are also often heavily influenced by non-humans. The humans of Adar, by the Kalashtar culture, in Seer Karn by the Aneko and Oni, and in the Tashana Tundra by the Shifters and Dwarves that also live there. In Corvair, despite Galifar politically connecting the continent for almost a thousand years, the five nations maintain their own distinct national cultures, with even more distinct differences for outlying areas like the Shadow Marches. The humans of other continents, which are centered mainly in Stormreach and Zendrik, and on the Saren Islands of Arganesson, vary again, with Stormreachers being a melting pot for families that have been there for centuries, and newcomers from every nation in Corvair, many of them criminal, and the Sarens largely influenced by the presence of dragons so nearby. 
Religion is one big part of culture. The religion of humans is split between three core faiths, but then has hundreds of smaller faiths ranging from the practices of a single family to the majority of just one or two nations. In modern Rirja, the paths of inspiration, led by chosen and inspired leaders of the nation, focuses on doing what is right for the community as communicated through the inspired spirits and their chosen. Working hard and following the right path in life will mean you are reincarnated to a higher form, and your own spirit might someday reach the level of the inspired as well. The path of inspiration is followed by the majority of Rirjan citizens, which is why it is one of the largest faiths in the world. The second largest faith is that of the vassals of the Sovereign Host, a polytheistic religion that is most widespread in Corvair, believing in nine gods of civilization, who are directly worshipped, and six dark gods of the wilds, called the Dark Six, who aren't directly venerated by most, but do receive oaths and sacrifices to avoid their wrath. The beginnings of the modern faith of the Sovereign Host began in the Rirjan nation of Pyrene and spread to other Sarlonan nations from there, though almost no Sarlones still follow that religion, and few of the people in Corvair know of its origin. At this point, the Host is worshipped by people of all races, as the Sarlonan settlers incorporated local gods and religions into their own, treating similar gods as other names for their own gods. Some monstrous races, and even people on the other side of the law, will sometimes secretly, or in areas of Drom and Dargoon, quite openly worship the gods of the Dark Six. The Sovereign Host and Dark Six are very mutable faiths, and reinterpretation, or even heresy, occur constantly. The third largest religious group for humans is the Silver Flame, a much more modern religion begun only after Tira Marone, a paladin of the sovereign Dolora actually, assisted Aquatl in resealing the demonic overlord Belshalor. This only happened back in 299 YK after the founding of Galifar. The church was formed around the remnant of the silver flame spouting from the site where the Overlord was bound, which is now Flamekeep Thrain. The church is dedicated to encouraging the light of virtue and eradicating evil forces, especially supernatural evils. Purified of the flame are a minority in all regions except for Thrain, but do you have a significant minority of worshippers in the humans of all Corvaran nations, plus the settlement in Zendrick, Stormreach. Humans are key worshippers in many more religions also, like the Path of Light, as brought to Adar by the Kalashtar, the Blood of Vol, a slim majority religion in Karnath, and a small minority in the rest of Corvair or the Draconic Totem Worship in the Saren Islands off Arganesson, and of course, Cults of the Dragon Below can find worshippers among any species. Dragonmark races are a key factor to Eberron, and humans are central having the ability to form dragon marks, both true and aberrant. Humans are lucky to be able to bear five different dragon marks. Let's look at them in the order their houses formed. The Mark of Sentinel appeared on a number of human families in the area that is now Karnath. One of these families was the noble family Denith. Denith was able to unite the many clans that received the dragon mark and when a dragonmark house structure was later adopted, that clan became the house's namesake. The coat of arms and symbol of Denith both feature a chimera, a three-headed magical beast thought to represent the three main families that formed the core of the house when it was started over a thousand years before the founding of Galifar. 
The Mark of Sentinel itself grants protective abilities. Spells that shield others from physical or magical attacks. And the physical mark looks like a stylized dragon standing on its hind legs, with that dragon's wings unfurling as the mark increases in power. Due to a combination of their martial history in Karnath, House Denith runs two guilds, plus another organization involving fighting. Their guilds are the Defenders Guild, who hires out mercenary bodyguards from within the house or from outside contractors, making direct use of their shielding powers of their mark, if they are dragon marked, to protect their clients, and using more traditional methods if they're not. The other guild is the Blade Marks, a more classic mercenaries guild. It employs mercenaries from across Corvair, some members of House Denith, some independent contractors, and guarantees both a high level of professionalism and steady work for its hirelings. The Blade Marks are considered the core of the house's financial success. The final organization is one Denith was ordered to create by Galifar I himself, an extranational police force called the Sentinel Marshals. They are elite police that go after high-profile criminals that have crossed borders between nations. This duty was even reinforced upon the breakup of the nation of Galifar by the Treaty of Thronehold, as the Marshals are in charge of capturing war criminals sought by one nation or another for their actions during the course of the last war, and are specifically allowed to cross national borders to do so. Because of their roles, Dunneth is the only dragon-marked house allowed to have a standing army under the Treaty of Korth. Their headquarters is in Carlacton, Karnath, and their current leader is Brevin de Dunneth. The second of the human dragon marked houses is House Caneth, which formed a scant century after House Danith. A number of human artisans, craftspersons, and traveling tinkers from the human kingdom of Metrol began manifesting the dragon marks, just in time for the new house to participate in the War of the Mark as the supplier of goods of war for the other houses. The house took on the metallic beast, the Gorgon, as their coat of arms and house symbol, due to their relationship with metallurgy. Their mark, the mark of making, gives its bearer enhanced abilities with crafting and repairing items, both magical and mundane. As the mark grows in power, it even allows them to create items out of thin air. The least form of the mark resembles a serpentine dragon, or maybe a harp? But as it becomes more powerful, the more traditionally dragon-like it becomes. With the power of the mark gives over the construction of physical goods, it is no surprise that House Caneth's two guilds are involved directly with craft. The Tinker's Guild licenses repair shops and traveling repair persons, and the Fabricator's Guild takes care of construction of manufactured goods. The house itself mostly avoids directly running retail shops. Instead, they create the majority of the mass-produced goods and give local blacksmiths or other craftspersons the ability to sell their goods, with the local being in charge of creating the more rare or sp specifically needed local items for their patrons. Though the Gorgon seal for your business does mean that your goods meet minimum can of quality standards, even for anything you've made locally. House Caneth is known for collaborating with other houses and groups in some of their magical and technological marvels. The Lightning Rail was a collaboration with House Orion. Elemental Galleons and more recently Elemental Airships were designed alongside both House Leandar and a group of Zill Elemental Binders. And most houses collaborate with Caneth to create the magical tools that they use to enhance their dragon marks. The most important magical technology that Caneth has developed without collaboration from other houses was the Warforged. Though at this point it is 
illegal to create more of them. The headquarters of House Caneth was in the city of Making in Syrie, which was destroyed alongside the patriarch of the house and his heir, which means the three regional barons that remain, Merrick's de Caneth in Sharn Breland, Jorlana de Caneth in Fairhaven Ondare, and Zorlan de Caneth in Korth, Karnath, are all vying for leadership of the house in the aftermath of the last war. House Orion is about 600 years younger than either Caneth or Daneith, but still formed before Galifar was founded. Groups of experienced travelers and teamsters all grouped together once they realized that they all had a mark in common and built outward with the house from its origins in Ondar. The house has taken the unicorn as its symbol, connecting back to their close ties to horseback travel. When you manifest a mark of passage, it gives you faster speeds on foot, both magical and mundane, as well as some access to short-range personal teleportation. The more powerful versions of the mark allow you to summon phantom steeds, or even use long-distance teleportation magic. All forms of the mark appear, to me at least, as either a dragon's claw or a flying dragon coming in for a landing. Orion runs two guilds, the Courier's Guild, which runs mail service throughout Corvair, with mail routes ranging from slow mail delivered via horse-drawn caravans to fast ones carried via rail service, up to even next-day delivery via teleportation. And for the right price, the Courier's Guild can guarantee delivery anywhere in Corvair, even to extreme and dangerous places. The other guild is the one they are famous for, the Transportation Guild. Their teamsters handle the majority of overland cargo everywhere in Corvair, with caravans and more taking it to its destination. Likewise, overland passenger travel is also their purview. Orion maintains trade roads and leaves caravans to just about every corner of Corvair, and regular people can book passage either in one of the caravans itself, or alongside it, for the extra protection that the group will bring. Further, Orion, with the help of Canna, developed the lightning rail network that revolutionized travel for Corvair. A journey that would take months on foot, or weeks with an Orion caravan, would instead take only days on the rail. Orion is currently headquartered in the city Passage in Ondare and their patriarch is Baron Quanti Dorian. Humans have been domesticating animals since the beginning of their existence, but about a hundred years after the Mark of Passage was found elsewhere, not far away, some got a special magical advantage. Farmers, animal handlers, and breeders living in what is now the eastern part of the Eldine Reaches began manifesting a new dragon mark. Soon they had formed House Vidalis and took on a hippogriff as their symbol, one of the beasts that they breed and train with the power of their dragon mark. That mark is called the Mark of Handling and gives power to control, enhance, and at some higher levels of power, summon animals. The mark itself looks to be a dragon about to pounce with its wings unfurling as it leaps into the air and takes flight. House Vidalis is not as flashy as some of the other houses, but their handler's guild is essential to the progression of animal breeding, training, and animal health. They license shepherds, stable hands, and other people who care for animals. The house has improved livestock, and their mage breeding program has created the best horses, rivaled only by the magical mounts of Valinar. Further, they have created other superior animals for use in hunting and war. Breland even has a brigade that rides mage-bred bears. 
and many nations purchased trained griffins, hippogriffs, and other flying mounts raised and trained by House Vidalis. The house is still based in the original region in the Eldine Reaches, and the small city of Varna has grown up nearby to support their sprawling farm complex, which they called Fullwood Stable. Their current leader is Baron Dalin de Vidalis. The last of the human dragon marks is the most recently discovered, and the only one we're covering in this video that emerged after the founding of the Kingdom of Galavar. House Therashk was formed exactly 500 years ago, in 498 YK, by joining three tribes of the Shadow Marches together, though there is evidence that the marks appeared on the peoples of the marches for centuries before. They just remain undiscovered as the marches are so far from the core of the Five Nations. This mark is unique, however, as the only dragon mark that appears on two species, both humans and half-orcs. So the house features a multitude of both, as well as many orcs as well, though the orcs operate in non-dragon marked capacities. The symbol of the house is the lion drake, often called the dragon. No matter the race of the bearer, the Mark of Finding allows its user perceptive abilities as well as magics used to locate people, animals, or natural resources. As the Mark grows in power, the magics are able to locate even more varieties of things as well as make use of even more general divination magics. The least Mark looks like a dragon's head, and as it grows in power, it's kind of like a camera is moving out on that dragon, showing more and more of it until the whole dragon is pictured. House Therashk only runs one guild, though there are many different types of businesses that run through that finder's guild. They are known for their bounty hunters, who can always find their mark, and inquisitives, that can find evidence that others miss. But the core of their business is prospecting. The powers of the mark allow them to find minerals underground with less digging, so they are always hired to locate the best location for mining operations for which the house takes a cut. But their ability to hunt down and dig up dragon charts is what made the house rich. A new business they have gotten into recently is mercenaries. They're, they act as a go-between for those looking to hire monstrous soldiers like trolls or ogres out of Droam. This business has created a division between Denith and Therashk and might be a violation of the Korth treaties. But that has so far, at least, been officially ignored by the remaining five nations. The house is led out of the community of Zerashak in the Shadow Marches, by a triumvirate of tribal leaders. Derek Develderin, Kundar Ashta, and Magrim Torm to Therashk. All of these houses have a lot more to them, and will be covered in more detail in their own videos at some point in the future, alongside the houses of people of other ancestries as well, of course. Luckily, in every edition of D&D that Eberron has appeared in, it's very easy to play a human, as they appear in that edition's core player's handbook. If you want to play a dragon-marked human in 3.5, the dragon marks were a series of feats, with additional feats that could be taken later to upgrade the power of the mark. You could begin at level 1 as a human with a dragon mark feat, as humans uniquely got a feat as a racial trait. You could take it at any time later as well, representing a mark spontaneously appearing. For the Sivirus mark, there was a prestige class that characters could not qualify for until they reached at least level 11. 
the Dragonmark feats and the Arrow Sybaris Prestige class appear in the Eberron campaign setting. In 4th edition, the Dragon Mercs were again feats, which appeared in the Eberron Campaign Guide. And they could be taken at any level, including level 1. And again, humans got a bonus feat as a racial trait. The Sybaris Mercs were instead gained via an Epic Destiny selected at level 21. The era Sybaris Destiny also appeared in the Campaign Guide. For 5th edition, Dragon Marks instead appear as sub-races in Eberron Rising from the Last War, and its predecessor, Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron. Within Rising, there was no way to expand upon the powers of the Mark directly, though Wayfinder's Guide does contain a feat to upgrade it to a greater Dragon Mark level. And the expansion ebook, Morgrave Miscellany, has mechanics to gain a Dragon Mark after level 1 the fledgling Dragonmark feats. As well, it included Sybarith's Mark mechanics, which were feats for characters level 12 or higher. These mechanics have been partially updated with the release of Rising from the Last War, as they were written with the mechanics originally released with the Wayfinder's Guide in mind. However, the subrace has changed somewhat between those two publications. Wayfinder's Guide did get the updates to match what was in Rising from the Last War, but Morgrave Miscellany only got a partial update, so some of the mechanics are not fully compatible. If you do decide to use the Fledgling and Sybaris marks from Morgrave Miscellany, I might recommend adding the Spells of the Mark feature from the printed versions of the associated subrace. So let's get this wrapped up. Humans in Eberron are defined by their ability to adapt to their surroundings and circumstances. This is why they are one of Eberron's most varied peoples. When you are creating a human character in Eberron, be it a player or non-player character, I would make the following recommendation. You don't really need to focus on them being human all too much. It's more important to think about their background, their nation of origin, and if they're dragon marked or not more than just if they're human, and then think about how those conditions have forced them to adapt to their circumstances. One cons consideration you should make, since humans are not as long-lived as other common species, and especially if they are from Corvair and not Dragonmarked, is that they have lived their entire lives with the last war surging around them. So consider how that has affected them, their family, and their outlook on life. So that closes the book for now on humans in this installment of the Library of Kornberg. So thanks for watching. I've already started work on the next video. I'm going to be looking closely at dwarven character miniatures in a new Eberron collector. Subscribe so you don't miss it. Or if it's out already when you're watching this one, the end card should show that here now. If you do have any questions or suggestions on the bit of lore I should cover in a future video, please leave a comment.